Hi, this podcast is recorded on Gadigal land. Lee and I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this place and also the custodians of the place where you're listening, wherever you are. <laughs> All right, so <clears throat> Sales has just watched Tom Holland singing in the rain lip sync battle. <laughs> wow. <laughs> right? Oh my God. I, when you, so I couldn't visualize who you were talking about. In fact, I've just. Googled him after you've made me watch that to Couldn't get a look at his face. Couldn't pick him out of a lineup. Always wearing a mask. Yeah. So I just assumed when you mentioned him, he's like just some Marvel beefcake, beefcake kind of dude. Uh, and wow, his dancing was off the charts. Uh-huh. That was absolutely amazing. Apparently, he got into trouble um, afterwards because he brought his partner Zendaya along, and she's just up the back of the audience, <laughs> like wearing a baseball cap and a t-shirt, not knowing that he was about to pull out <laughs> one of the great dance routines. Of all time. <laughs> and, but like, his, the, the, as soon as I was shown this thing, um, I just had to watch it again immediately. And I think what really just makes me so pleased about it is that this Hollywood superstar who is, you know, inordinately successful will put as much effort into getting into drag and rubber and dancing <laughs> and doing a dance routine, to, you know. I just think it's so cool. He's so cool and such a great dancer. It is just so pleasurable to watch. How cut he was just reminds me of a funny conversation we had this morning, which was we were, were in a uh, kind of brainstorming session for our tour with the Australian Chamber Orchestra, which by the time this podcast comes out is this week. So if you want to come quickly jump online and get tickets, it's Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne. Julian Thompson, who's one of the lovely cellists at the ACO, we were talking about activities you don't do as a musician because it might ruin your ability to play your instrument. And one of the things he said was (laughs) if there's a cellist, you get too ripped in the gym and your bicep gets really big, it's problematic for hitting first position on the cello because your own body is getting in the way of where your hand needs to be. It was so hilarious because we just imagined Julian showing up, Julian showing up at work after a summer where he's gone to the gym for two hours a day and like, dudes, I don't play in first position anymore, okay? I'm too ripped. <laughs> I'm too ripped. <laughs> I had really good intentions for this podcast, given that the last one was all about pop culture. I had really good intentions for this one to be highbrow, but look where Doesn't we are already. Doesn't have to be, love. I mean, it's fine. Um, it's the beauty I, of know. chat 10, isn't it? Well, lowbrow and highbrow, they have to meet somewhere, don't they? Middle. Tr- true that. Yeah. Um, I do have a couple of highbrow things to discuss. However. Okay, and then I'll spoil it with something. Okay, good. Keep it with me. So I read this. My friend Evan recommended me to read this short story, and it's one of these situations where you then discover the person has all of this work that you and you've never heard of them. It's right. a woman called Claire Keegan. Yes. The book is called So Late in the Day. Yep. Have you read it? Yes. Oh, <laughs> have you talked about it on here before? No. I oh, think okay. I have actually. Weirdly enough, I think I've read it. I, I went on a bit of a Claire Keegan kind of. Ah. Oh. Yeah. You you talk, and um, I'll drop in. Okay, so my friend texted me and said, you need to read this. We've got like super similar taste in literature. He said, you you are definitely going to love this. He said, the cover blurb, whoever's written it, says something like this story is Chekhovian. And, 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 you know, the person even who said that said, and I appreciate that sounds like an overstatement, but it's really kind of not. And then my friend said to me, you know, I thought it wasn't, I thought it was going to be an overstatement. And then I read it and it's, it really isn't. Um, It was so good it is basically a man reflecting on a relationship uh with a woman i don't want to say too much because i don't want to kind of spoil anything about it It, it's uh, so i read it and loved it but then um the same friend who recommended it said okay now you need to go to the new yorker fiction podcast because they get her to read the short story and then they do a kind of dissection of the short story i haven't listened to that yet you've sent me the you've sent me the link oh i've got it in my little Cheap so pouch. just the act of listening, to, the analysis of it and their chat was fine, but actually just listening to her read it added so much to my appreciation and understanding of it. Oh, man, it is a good, good, good piece of work. She is um, completely um, a remarkable writer. It'll only take you probably an hour to knock it over. So uh, 
it's not an arduous read. And in fact, it, the podcast to listen to her read it aloud, I think, takes about half an hour. It's not not very long at all. Yeah, that's why I could see that it um it was going to take like a little bit longer than I had. So I've got it in my little you know. It'll be a real treat. It'll be a nice thing to listen to on a plane. And she's got this beautiful Irish accent, of course. And so just hearing her read it is absolute heaven. Apparently, they say in the analysis of it that. She, so she was lecturing in creative writing and she kept trying to give an example of a story where there's tension but not drama. And so she was using this plot device that she's got um, to say to the students, for example, something like this, there'll be tension but there's not really drama, you know, there's not a kind of unfolding um, action sequence. And and then she ended up thinking, this is actually a pretty good idea, I should write this, and then that was the origins of it. Well. And, and that's the, the genius of the format is this sense of tension that's almost palpable mm. even though it's not tethered by these sort of big prongs of plot development which you kind of um, – I mean I often rely on if I don't have a lot of time to read something, you know, I'm sort of leaping from peg to peg of, of story. But when you come across a writer who can – construct this sort of mesh of of tension and you can't really see why you feel that yes. way it's it's so yeah. so good and even once I knew the so once I knew kind of what happened and and you know what's the source of the tension once I've read the story once then listening to her read it again where you can concentrate a bit more on what's she actually doing here I mean yeah. it's still almost you know, as we talk about all the time with good writing, you really can't see the stitches. I really yeah. still feel like I don't exactly know how she she did it so brilliantly. Well, yeah, I'm going to go great. listen to that um, because um, – Oh, you'll so, really so, enjoy it. So she's reading it. She's reading it, yeah. Mm. Um, she – so I forget who it is who's talking about it. It's, I keep, the name Graydon Carter keeps coming to me. It's not Graydon Carter who was the – editor of Vanity Fair it's some um, oh um god yes uh him George um, George uh, Saunders Saunders George god. Saunders he didn't want we to are, read it aloud our executive function is just fine <laughs> <laughs> menopausal ladies yeah, at your uh, service uh George Saunders is the person discussing it with yep. the host of the fiction podcast he didn't want to read it aloud because um the c word is used in it and he said he didn't feel comfortable saying the c word but the use of the c word it is the perfectly chosen word in the context in which it's used and so he was like I didn't want to I don't want to wreck the story there's no other word that fits as uniquely and perfectly as this word and so Claire Keegan kindly huh. agreed to read it herself which I think it, good I mean, approach interestingly as well because obviously not every author is a good reader. Yeah. Her reading is absolutely fantastic. She could be a professional reader, I reckon. It was fantastic. Professional reader. She oh, was great. Keep on trucking, Claire. <laughs> keep, I mean, keep scribbling, but also you might have another career yeah, in reading other career. people's books. Like, yep. <laughs> Look, she's just an absolutely ridiculously talented woman. Good on you. Um, I have just watched the first episode now of uh, The Dictator. Um, which is a new TV series uh, featuring Kate Winslet. Kate Winslet. Anyway, I, I read a little bit about this, and it was sort of hailed as this sort of extraordinary comic role, and um, she's playing some sort of Central European dictator in the roughly present day. And so I kind of thought, well, what is this going to be like? Absolutely tremendous is the answer. Oh wow! I've okay. listened, I've, it's and it's one of those things the stuff that I like about it so far is also what I liked about the great which is just the reconstruction of this incredibly lavish world inhabited by people who are incredible at acting and right. uh, fantastically wardrobed as well uh. but it's also just really dark and savage and funny in a kind of really uncomfortable way so she is um a uh, a dictator who has won a democratic election a number of years ago that involved, I think, the, the death or at least maiming of her um, democratic opponent. Um, and she has taken the small uh, party formed by her father, who's in a fridge in the basement, um, who's dead, and she's built it into a just this extraordinary autocratic regime with mm. her at the centre. And 
Uh, she is Winsletian in her range. Um, she has a slight sort of Central European twang, but it's mainly a British accent that she has. She is paranoid that the palace in which she lives is full of mould and spores. So she gets this sort of um, very muscular fighter from one of her politzai style units to... Um, uh, to lead her around the castle, testing the air for uh, moisture while she's in turn berating various of her advisors and her <laughs> sort of cabinet and so on. It is – it's a real tour de force. Is it um – is it one of those shows where you feel like, God, oh, I just don't want to go to bed because I want to watch another episode? Or well, it's it? one of, they're drip feeding it, so there's oh. only one to watch. I, oh. I would certainly have um, have gone again for sure. Okay. Um, but wow, there is something about the wholeness of her commitment to this role because she's obviously a monster, but she's also in that way that dictators um, and bullies so often are has this very close to the surface sense of anxiety and fear that she stamps down with violence mm. and horror um, upon others. And I don't know whether it's watching a female character embody that kind of dictatorial role and obviously the freedom of having it be fiction rather than attempting to um, pay even lip service to the life of an existing monarch or dictator or whatever, plutocrat, um, makes it, I don't know, the, the, the psychology of, of, the, of a person who needs to dominate others because of their own deep fear mm. um, so much more interesting and kind of textured. So you said it was funny. Is it a black comedy? Mm. Oh, yeah. Oh, right. yeah. Okay. And so, so for instance, I mean – she lives in this giant castle and she's got um, advisors and ministers and so on. And um, the woman who, who kind of runs her household um, is this sort of cheery, cockney, brutal, kind of foul-mouthed, fabulous character. Um, so it, it doesn't make any sense, you know, um, but it is – I just loved it. I I thought it was fantastic. Mm, okay. I, and, I, and and yeah. funny in the sense that, you know, it's it's brutal about terrible things. Right. Um, and yet there is this sort of pathetic vulnerability that is also funny the way she does it. I don't know. It's, yeah. As soon as I saw it land, I put the like yep. put it on my watch list but mm. just haven't got around to it yet. Um, do you know what I have been watching? And, again, I'm really hoping that you have been watching it as well one day. Oh, yeah, I've watched all of that. Oh, okay. Um, great. I am only about four or five in. I have read the book by David Nichols on which I it's haven't. based. Okay. okay. So, but I can't really remember it. I've got a vague, um, I'm not going to say it out loud because I don't want to spoil it to anyone, but I've got a vague sense of, oh, yeah, I think this is what happens, but I'm not entirely sure. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of watching it mm -hmm. sort of fresh. Um, I think I've never seen either of those two actors before who are the leads, mm. who play Emma, Emma and Dexter. Uh, I think they're both fantastic did you like yeah, it um i absolutely loved it and ambika mod who is um the character the woman who actor who plays emma she was um also in the tv series that was the dramatization of this is going to hurt oh, that yeah. adam k yeah which you yeah which i she was extraordinary in that and for the first couple of episodes of this show I'm like I, I know I love you but I can't remember why <laughs> and that's where she's from wow she is just is mind-blowing is this is gonna hurt is that got the guy who's Q in the Bond films it, yes I can't remember his name uh <laughs> sadly so does it – over what time period does the whole thing elapse well so I mean they they sort of meet so it's about these um friends who meet when they're at, at uni. At uni and they're at Edinburgh University and they're sort of both studying acting a little bit and literature a little bit, you know, sort of thing. And he then – and they meet and shag, I think. they. No, episode one they kind of – they have a bit of a pash but they never actually – Right. Up, he sleeps over but, but nothing kind of happens. Right. And then they just kind of – it's just one of those like – it just never quite lands. They sort of fancy each other a bit, but it never really goes anywhere. Yeah, and, and then he becomes quite successful. He's he's 
um, you know, on this TV show, this is on telly, and she's sort of in this travelling kind of theatrical group and then she um, becomes a teacher and so their lives sort of digress, uh, diverge a little bit. And so it, it covers, I guess, probably... 25, 30 years. Okay, yeah, because I'm because I'm only in episode four or five, and oh, I know you've got I a fair way to go. Yeah. Was, I thought it was going to be six episodes, and then I kind of spooled. No, no, no. It's and then more. I was like, oh, there's about fourteen. Like it's yeah. quite long. Yeah, yeah. So then I was wondering, and, and yeah, because in my memory, my recollection of the book is that it kind of goes for quite some time. Yeah, yeah so, You've got a bit. You've got yeah. a, a fair way to go. Okay. And a lot of years to cover. Okay. Um, yeah, I I actually couldn't stop watching it, and I I think I was watching it when I was I was going through a phase of not being able to speak all that much and um and so I was just letting it roll over and um yeah I'm, I'm kind of thing. irritated every time I have to walk away from it but it's I'm yeah just being slow to get through it um I'm irritated every time I have to walk away but <laughs> while we're on uh, great British actors or kind of GBAs yeah actually there's a bit of British slash Irish content in this um today uh Andrew Scott who was oh. the pr- hot priest in Fleabag yeah so um he, do you know, I've talked before about National Theatre at Home. Which yes, you can, you've talked about that excessively, I'd I say. Have. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> so the Dendy uh, cinemas in Australia, they sometimes on the big screen put stuff. So yep. the Fleabag, for example, they yeah. had that on Frankenstein. I that missed I, that. I saw, to. yeah, yeah, that's right. So they've got a production that uh, is on um, right now called Vanya, which it stars Andrew Scott. It's a one-man show. It's based on the Chekhov play Uncle Vanya. Uh, and basically Andrew Scott plays every character in it. And so it's oh. a kind of adaptation, but he sort of meanders between the characters. It's one of those extraordinarily skillful things where after a while you forget that you're watching one person do it all because you just buy that the person standing by the sink is this person and the person who's out the back oh, God, is... Oh, that's the... annoying to find out that that guy's good at everything. It, it <laughs> He is just wonderful. It's really fantastic. So I recommend uh, if you... Uh, you know, you like theatre and you like, as I've said before of this, you like seeing the great plays and the great actors that are on in London's West End. They do a brilliant job of filming them as well. They're just, as you know from seeing the Frankenstein one, it was just absolutely wonderful. God, that's just a little pot of gold, isn't it, that um, that resource? It's so great because, of course, you know, for most of us, we're never going to get to London to see these things. I mean, National Theatre isn't Except doing... for us when we go there for our 10-year July show. <laughs> Woohoo! Uh, National th- this. Dorian Gray with Sarah Snook is not a national theatre production, so it won't be under this, but it's on in London at the moment. I mean, of course, I would love to see that. And word of mouth is it's, that Sarah Snook just is... unbelievably great. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, I'd love to get to see that. I wonder if that extended the season. I guess she's so in demand that... It's the theatre. is they, they get, They're booked up so many years in advance. You can't just extend because <sighs> then something else has the theatre. So And also she has a small baby. So of course I guess she does, the question selfishly. Is. But, I mean, it'll go to New York. It's been a massive hit in London, so presumably it'll end up in New York. Um, anyway, it's these these kind of great performances, you know, unlike a film, it's it's one-off, mm. right? You, go, you, you see it or you don't see yeah, it. Yeah, it's true. But uh, let's not forget the actor who did it first. True that Erin mm. Jane Norville, who's oh also God. fantastic. Yeah, all about people are doing twenty-seven jobs at once. <laughs> um, what else? What else? What else? Oh, yesterday I went to see a kids' movie. Yeah. Um, with Kate, and yeah. it's called Migration, mm-hmm. and it is this fabulous story that I just absolutely loved, and it's nearly done, I think, in the cinemas, but you can now get it on streaming, and it's um, an animated movie, and it's about a family of mallards who are living in their pond somewhere in, I don't know, somewhere in America, and um, a bunch of uh, migrating, beautiful, glorious, (laughs) plumage-like, heavy other ducks just sort of drop into their pond for a bit of a refresher while they're flying south. And um, most of the Mallard family are just totally entranced, but the dad who's very kind of, no, no, we've got our pond, we're not going anywhere dangerous, tells them bedtime stories about predators every single night, we're not going anywhere. (laughs) And then the mum duck who just says, listen, listen, Barry, (laughs) I'm getting sick of your constant fear-mongering. Why can't we go to Jamaica? It sounds like fun. How about some fun? We used to have fun. And so eventually (laughs) off they fly to try and find Jamaica. And on the way, of course, they lose their way. They wind up in New York City. Barry was right. Yeah, Barry was pretty right. But um, his name's Mac, actually. So it's (laughs) hilarious, like, watching my dad being a duck. (laughs) Although my dad would, of course, 
migrated immediately. But um, so, uh, you know, they meet these um, gangs of pigeons in New York. <laughs> you know, they they get into a war with a, a restaurateur who serves, of course, duck and orange and, you know. Anyway. Is it famous people's voices? Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Like it's, you know. That it's funny. Oh, my God. It's, it's you know, it's got Aquafina in it. It's got, you know, all of the people, Danny DeVito. But the thing is, like the whole story is really just about – you know, things that you're really, really scared of but you shouldn't be and also things that you absolutely trust but that you shouldn't. So oh, it's, yeah, it's kind of good. like it's it's a really nice little parable just about sometimes things that you've been trained to be afraid of, people, you know, different people or whatever um, turn out to be worth Do you- not immediately shutting down around I don't know it's just like they're pretty barn door sized social lessons but it just yeah. the film does it so kids, nicely yeah I um, really loved it I had this conversation on the weekend with childhood friend Mandy in fact because we went CFM. away to celebrate our um 50th and we went kayaking this day Foolish. Yeah. and uh the, the guy who was giving us the kind of instructions at the start freaked us out a bit by saying, um, okay, now you've got four lots of rapids to go through. And we were like, what? No, it was any rapids. <laughs> That's four but too many. <laughs> it was a really enjoyable morning. And we said later, like we both kind of balked a bit when he met at the mention of rapids, not being experienced kayakers. And we were saying it's so it would have been so easy for us to go, oh, I don't know about that. Let's not do it. But we, we did do it even though we were a bit scared. And it was fantastic and we were saying it was a great lesson to just push through your irrational fears. <laughs> yes, yeah, see, I'm a fan of that too but then again I, I'm not going to go kayaking along rapids with you. <laughs> I mean that's just my choice. Um, so just a couple of other things I wanted to briefly mention. Two books that I have recently read, they're both kind of memoirish. Well, they both are memoirs actually. One is um, by my friend Michael Gawenda, My Life as a Jew. Oh, right, which I've there was, that was extracted. I've read the extract. It was, yeah. I haven't yeah. read the book yet. So Michael wrote it before the events of October 7 and then it's landed, it's come out kind of after. Wow, okay. I was wondering about that timing. Um, so he uh, – it's about his um, – well, it's as advertised in the title, it's about his life as a Jewish man. Michael was in Washington at the same time as me 20 or so years ago and we became great friends and great friends with his family. I feel like I've learnt so much from him about – culture about family about judaism about a whole lot of stuff that i knew Mm. absolutely nothing about his parents um were he was born in a refugee camp his parents were refugees in the second world war um his aunts and uncles various of them were rounded up and never heard from ever again and so it's kind of michael's it's it's reflections on lots of different things but for example it's about you know being when we become journalists, we're kind of told, leave your opinions at the door and so forth. Mm. And so it's about, he was the editor of the Age newspaper. It was about, well, um, I did that and I, I would always try to check my opinions at the door and now I look back on that and I think, well, is that, you know, it's just he's kind of wrestling with that question of, mm. of, you know, is that viable, is it possible, is it right, you know, all this stuff. I found it a super interesting reflection. Well, wow, that would be, um, I mean, that's a pretty interesting set of questions for you given the book you've just written about um about journalism yeah, and absolutely. leaving your opinion at the door which is something you've given speeches about yeah I mean did it change your mind about that I'm belief always of yours? I'm always interested in hearing about people's experiences and their opinions and what has kind of formed them and led them to that position yeah. and what I've enjoyed about being friends with Michael over the years is that he he's always thinking and thoughtful and tossing around difficult mm-hmm. questions, you know, like Ghana, like, right, that's why we like Ghana. So I just like trying to understand, you know, where is Michael coming from and how do his life experiences and his family's life experiences influence his thinking because it helps me understand him more as a friend. And so I just kind of enjoy that. Same with this other book I'm reading, which also is about something I know nothing about. It's called Barbarian Days by William Finnegan. It won the Pulitzer Prize for nonfiction. It's a memoir basically about his love of surfing. What? He's a writer with The New Yorker. Um, And when he was young, he grew up in Hawaii, he was mad keen surfer, then California. And then kind of in his 20s, he starts traveling the world, just hunting for big waves to surf, basically. And it's about his adventures doing that. Now, I love I've never gone surfing because I'm a bit scared of the ocean. I love watching surfers. I love sitting in proximity mm. to surfers and eavesdropping on their conversations. Waxing their boards. Waxing their boards, know, all the stuff Bring them hot do. chips. I find their whole subculture super, super interesting and 
unique and amazing. Does that sustain a book though? It is. It's so beautiful and amazing and interesting. And it, it's a really long book too. But it's whole. I, I was about to say, things. surely it's a short book. It's a long book. Um, his writing is so beautiful. As I said, it won the Pulitzer Prize. It's kind of like reminds me a bit of that book called The Overstory, which is about trees. And you're yeah. like, well, how does this dude write 700 pages on trees? And this this guy's written 700 pages on the ocean and surfing and um, and a wave. And what does it feel like to ride a wave? And what does it feel like to to harness the power of the ocean and so forth? Um, I just absolutely love it. Anyone that's into surfing or ocean swimming, you will adore it. Uh, but yeah, it's just it's just wonderful. And so these two books are both about things that I really kind of have no personal experience of, just don't really know anything about whatsoever. And so I'm finding it really interesting to just immerse in these worlds and think, all right, aha, uh-huh, that's interesting. Almost as though that's almost what books are good at, really. Exactly. <laughs> Which reminds me, actually, um, I am. Um, um, interviewing Anne Patchett on the opening night of the Sydney Writers' oh. Festival um, coming up. And because the theme of that uh, festival this year is Take Me Away, um, which is kind of like, I mean, having not long ago finished Anne Patchett's most recent book, Tom Lake, I kind of was interested in the way that it was able to bear the reader back and forth across generations. And right. it's, I mean, it's, I assume not a – obviously I'll check this out before I'm actually interviewing her. <laughs> but um, it, it's got this sort of – I mean, she does write a lot about her own family and my favourite book of hers, Commonwealth, which is one of my favourite books ever really, um, is about um, her and her family as children. Um, but this ability later in life to be able to kind of swoop back and look at past – things that have happened to you over your life without regret, even though they were painful at the time, is such an interesting thing to learn, I think. I forget what it was called, but her book of essays that was the book out before Tom Lake, that's really wonderful and it's all that kind of stuff. Yeah, she's um, quite extraordinary. So I'm obviously shitting bricks about that immediately. (laughs) Um, But um, uh, if you haven't gotten to that book yet, get on to it straight away. Oh, my gosh, I feel like we're – like we could – go on for another half an hour. Do you know what I was just noticing? So when we started recording this morning, there's a timer that's been set up for us and we've been going so long that now it's just off. It's just off. Wow. We literally have run the clock down. All right. Well, maybe we'll – do you know what? I will come back to you with my – with – uh, patch at thoughts after the interview <laughs> yes <Ooh>. please do <laughs> but um do have a look at that program by the way because the sydney writers festival this year is just absolutely chockers with uh incredible writers coming to pay a visit good tip thank as you. they do <laughs> yeah Thank you very much for listening or watching. Uh, you can find more of our content on YouTube or if you don't like to look at our faces and let's face it, that would be fair enough. You can listen to us on Spotify or wherever else you choose.